Are you thinking of leaving corporate, but too afraid to make the move? Have you already escaped corporate, but are finding it hard to run your dream business? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure challenges out on your own? We have created a podcast for corporate escapees running their own business. This is the Corporate Escapees Podcast by Build, Live, Give. We bring you firsthand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day as a corporate escapee. We get real with no corporate BS. And now, over to your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to the Corporate Escapees Podcast by Build, Live, Give. I'm Paul Higgins, and today we have Barback Azad. Barback left Iran aged four with his family, and then he went into America and was really well educated, had a brilliant education career, and then he took a leap into starting his own business. It was a magazine, and to, in his own words, it was a um, it was a humbling experience. It didn't work out, but he learned some really valuable lessons. And then he worked for a company called Beach Body, which went from a $100 million business to a billion dollar business, where he was actively involved as a senior VP, did a lot of direct response and performance-based marketing. And then he joined a mastermind and realized that there was a lot of cool projects out there and a lot of great stuff he could do. And he decided to uh, leave and went through a a soft exit over 16 months to where he is now, which is uh, scaling his consulting business and looking to launch his own platform. A fantastic interview. You'll thoroughly enjoy it. So now what I'll do is hand you over to Barbak Azad. If you're enjoying listening to our guest stories, just letting you know we have a community for corporate escapees who are rapidly growing their dream business to find freedom. Just like you, it's called BLG Boost. You get exclusive access to a forum of like-minded peers answering your most pressing questions. You get actionable tips to solve your most common challenges. You get hundreds of trusted suppliers to save you time and money. You get member-only discounts. You get direct access to coaching by a global leader in the field and easy to implement content solving common topics mentioned in popular threads. If you are tired of being alone and are seeking the freedom of running your own business whilst meeting your financial goals, go to buildlivegive.com forward slash webinar. In case you missed it, the link will be in the show notes. Please check it out. Welcome, Barback Azad, to the Build Live Give Show. We're going to get to know a lot about you and your backstory today, but why don't you just start with a bit of that backstory? Hi, uh, well, glad to be here. Um, so yeah, so I um, I grew up here in LA. Um, my parents were immigrants. Um, we came from Iran when I was four, um, and uh, and grew up here in LA. Um, you know, so I uh, I currently have my own uh, thing. It's basically my own consulting business. But, you know, I never really, um, I never really thought of myself necessarily as an entrepreneur. And I frankly don't even like that title, certainly for myself, um, kind of just have my own business. And, you know, people, someone doesn't, someone else doesn't uh, employ me, but certainly people pay. Um, but, you know, I have, my background was, you know, grew up here. Um, I was a math major at MIT, went to invest in banking and business school. So kind of had, I don't know if it's traditional, but that, that part of the background and certainly was more of a, a path and a track, I think, that a lot of my friends uh, had taken as well. And then post business school really wanted to start something. So came down to LA, um, to start a free magazine for gyms and yoga studios. Um, say it's the best 25 grand I ever lost, uh, a pretty miserable experience looking back uh, or living through it. But it was, you know, when I look back, I should say, um, I can describe it as pretty neat. Um, you know, I was 30 years old living with my parents, um, was broke, you know, just was struggling. And so, um, you know, it was a good thing to have, uh, to gotten some humble pie and to get some well-needed humility uh, into my system. Uh, I was pretty naive about starting a business at that point. Um, but really, and then had some pretty tough times, frankly, personally, uh, in the year, couple of years that followed. Um, and then went to, finally got a job at Napster, the legal version, not nearly the exciting one that everyone else probably knows. Um, spent a couple of years there and then spent the bulk of my professional career at Beachbody. So P90X, Insanity, um, 21 Day Fix, Checkology, all that stuff. I was there for eight years. We were at 100 million when I got there and 10X the business, so left at a billion. So kind of turned out to be a nice round 10X number there. Um, And then uh, really for the last couple of years, I work with a handful of brands, helping them build their performance marketing businesses. 
Um, and I live here in LA with my wife and two boys. And um, yeah, pretty uh, pretty happy now. Um, it's taken a bit certainly to build to get to this point, but um, kind of in a, in a cool place and definitely plenty more going on. So, Brilliant. And, um, and uh, now we're going to get to ask a question a little more about Sarah in a moment, but what's something that your friends or family would know about you that other BLG listeners wouldn't? Uh, well, I'm pretty public. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how much I really hide other than the stuff that's super, um, super sensitive and intimate uh, and probably that's my wife. Um, but I'd say like, you know, most of my friends and family, um, they, I think, you know, one of my friends actually said she went back through my newsfeed. She was looking for something I posted and, you know, her comment to me was, well, you're, you love your family. You spend a lot of time with them. You've traveled to some really cool places. You share some pretty inspiring, uh, and motivational stuff and i was like well that's that's it feels really good and i think that's the kind of person i am you know i think i grew up um you know definitely had personal rough times not certainly like what a lot of people go through but you know high school was really rough for me and so i think there's just a sense of gratitude of what i have i'm very fortunate my parents um live 10 minutes from me my two sisters live within 10 minutes from me one is five houses down and so you know family um is very important the people around me are very important and you know, I try to keep some semblance of perspective and gratitude because that's, uh, I think I've, I've seen the other side of it. And so, and I've kind of had some rougher times. So I think when you go through that, you hopefully come out and, and you live a little bit more that way. I think it's, I'm still battling it and there are plenty of times I'm not, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think I try to try to live each day to, to get better. Um, it sounds cliche, but, you know, I think especially with, with two young kids, uh, two young boys, I think you realize the role model you are and, there are plenty of times when it's high decibel in the house, but uh, at the same time, it's, you know, you try got to try to be that better person so that, uh, so that they see that as well. Great. And, uh, and, you know, amazing success from a hundred mil to a, a bill with a uh, beach body. What was, take us to that f- sort of defining moment for you when you decided, no, look, uh, I want to leave this rocket ship and go out and do something myself. You know, I, um, I was part of, because so, when I got into the role, I was overseeing media and customer acquisition. And, you know, so TV was our bread and butter. We frankly were never that great at cold traffic. Um, and so I joined some digital marketing masterminds. Um, and uh, through that process, really, and through being some of those groups, started meeting some folks who were just frankly doing some cool stuff. And, you know, I was busting my butt. And frankly, I still am today. But, um, you know, just just started realizing that there was more that I wanted and particularly being, whether it's a founder or owner or whatever label you want to put it, um, you know, I think control is a myth, but I think there's a sense of control or it's a different kind of thing when you, when you have your own, when your own shop. Um, I'm fortunate because my wife um, comes from a family of folks running their own businesses and her dad um, has a few. And so, uh, you know, I had her support, but, you know, I remember the day was November of 2013. I came home from an event and told my wife, you know, it's time. Um, now, it took me 16 months to move on, um, which I actually talk about actually quite proudly because um, it wasn't like I could just leave right away. I didn't have a huge nest egg. I frankly think it probably led me to a better decision anyways. But, you know, I had a wife mortgaged uh, one boy at the time. We had a second one, I think. Uh, he, Cyrus was probably not yet there, but I mean, she wasn't pregnant yet, but I had a feeling we were going to be building towards a family. So I had a lot of practical responsibility. Um, and had to be somewhat pragmatic about it, despite, you know, the desire to, to go on my own. Great. And what were some of the fears? If you can look back then, what were some of the key fears that you had at the time? Oh, man. Well, so first of all, again, I don't have 50 million in the bank. So there is, uh, there's the rea- practical reality and the financial reality of, you know, what is the runway and um, how much do I have, especially because I was going to go do a, a startup, a pure startup, um, which meant no income pretty much for a while. And so how long could that go? How long was it going to take for us to raise some money? Um, you know, how long could we basically kind of last? And I had a good sense. I had a pretty good sense um, of it, which is a little also why the process took a little bit longer because um, I wanted to make sure I was in a little better position and in a kind of in a place where I felt comfortable. Um, but I kind of always knew that. And so certainly that's a very, you know, just pragmatic fear. Um, and then there's just, you know, there's a lot of stuff of, when you leave, um, you know, you're going on your own. I think, uh, frankly, being when you're an employee, um, there's a relative safety. Uh, it may be a little bit contrived and not real, 
um, because you know people can lay you off at any one at any point, and companies you know have challenges and things like that. So you know, there's certainly the idea of what happens and um, falling flat on my face. And in some ways, the startup, you know, we literally couldn't get off the ground. So within three months, some of those were realized. But at the same time, that's the nature of going down a startup path. Um, and so we just had to piece things together and get back up. Um, but certainly, you know, that idea of being intimidated, going into something I really hadn't done, the magazine I did years before, really, I mean, it was and wasn't really relevant. So it wasn't like I could take all those learnings and apply them very obviously here. Um, you know, there's definitely the fear of the unknown, the fear of, is this going to work? Um, you know, the fear of basically no, and, you know, basically being told you're crazy and, you know, it's a bad idea. And, you know, generally speaking, <laughs> People love to people love to say that no matter how good of an idea it, it may be. So you know, definitely very real stuff, and you know, certainly uh, not least of which is I was an SVP, you know, with a pretty good situation, had a lot of equity in terms of brand, like pers- uh, brand equity um, and, and influence in the business. So you know, I was going from something that was pretty I was pretty comfortable with to something that wasn't, and frankly, that was a little bit part of the point. Um, but you know, going from something where it's decent income. We could live a comfortable life. My job wasn't completely crazy um, to something that was going to be obviously much more uncertain. Yeah. I mean, there ever times that you have thought about going back that, you know, this journey is too hard and you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll jump back into something career or corporate. Um, so I'm not the kind of guy who's going to say never, but I, my hope is that it's never. Um, and I'm trying to do everything I can to do that. Um, you know, I think I've been, relatively fortunate you know i i, you know, I guess uh, i work my tail off so i mean I've, um, uh, my title is consultant i have a bunch of clients um but it's not like the four-hour work week by any stretch um that was never my goal and uh, that's, i don't think that's what tim ferris's point was really that it was only that time but um you know right now no i mean right now there's that's definitely not a thought i get calls from headhunters or talk to friends and um it's a very quick conversation that i have zero desire to go back frankly um, I work from home and I love that because my kids, first of all, I have no commute. Um, and the idea of just taking a shower, getting in the car, driving that whole thing and coming back and, um, you know, that's time. Plus also I got young kids and when they come back from school, they run in and, um, right now they're in a park, so <laughs> they're not going to interrupt right now. But, um, you know, I get a lot of time with my family and my wife, things like that. And so those kinds of things are not ones that I want to give up and, I'm fortunate too that my work right now, it's, I need a phone, a phone, Wi-Fi, my laptop, and um, I'm pretty good to go. So, you know, having that ability to, to operate that way means that um, we're, we don't always have to be bound by uh, physical location. Uh, it's really not at this point. Yeah, look, and it's been a while since I've been in LA, but I uh, saw a post last year of uh, someone at, I don't know, four in the morning on Thanksgiving Day leaving LA, and it was, <laughs> it was just a... A car park, so I could uh, imagine the huge benefits of not sitting in that traffic. And yeah, being I mean, able to it's work funny. From... I was actually in traffic yesterday, <laughs> and I told my wife that. And yeah, I mean, I, I drive maybe three miles. I mean, maybe I go out three miles a day, and uh, I take Lyft pretty, pretty much anywhere I go these days, other than when we're like as a family. So no, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate, and I mean, frankly, even you know, Beachbody was you know, 15 minute drive, which in LA is nothing. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, certainly if I don't have to, I don't need to. And then if I want to, I can, you know, I can go and work from coffee shop. I have a couple of clients here locally. So that gets me out every once in a while. But in general, yeah, I'd rather, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, I'm a back office gym and, and all that stuff. So it's, uh, I, I got a lot of what I need right here. Brilliant. And uh, you mentioned the mastermind, which is great. What other help have you got as you've built this consulting, consulting business? And I know we're going to hear more about the other sides of the business, but what sort of help have you got through this journey so far? Um, I mean, I think the first thing is really just the step of leaving um, the corporate, uh, I guess it was really, I guess it was corporate job. I never really thought about it that way, but I guess it really was. Um, you know, and certainly the support absolutely from my wife, uh, as I mentioned, um, I think that's crucial. I think if she wasn't totally on board, um, and then especially, you know, as I said, this, the, the startup, we just literally didn't get off the ground. Um, you know, she didn't react and uh and so there wasn't second guessing there was any questioning I and mean, we talked about it enough um but having that support and then you know definitely i'd say my family is probably I, I, they're probably maybe less supportive more in the sense that like they wanted me they know the struggles of going down your own route so it's not like they're not supportive i think it's just more 
if you could be in a situation that was maybe more comfortable. I think that's parents and siblings, right? I think mm. they don't want you to have to go through certain, some of those things, but they know kind of what's on the other side. Um, and then certainly friends, you know, I've, I've, there are a few ones and I've told them that and they know who they are, um, who were key both to influencing my desire as well as being super, super supportive um, as I was going down the path and continue to, to go down that path. And, you know, having folks that I can turn to and mentors and guides and friends and colleagues and, and pick a label, but having other folks and not feeling like at all, like I'm on my own, even though I am, my business is, is me. Um, that's a big, big deal. And certainly again, not being in an office environment and, and having that, you have to, you have to build some of that community for yourself. And again, I've been pretty fortunate to, um, to have, to have some folks that I trust and, and respect have been super, super helpful for that big, that's a big difference. And, uh, uh, and yeah, I definitely didn't have that. I didn't reach out enough the first time around. So it's been proactive certainly on my side as well. I've learned to ask for help. Yeah, and look, that's the whole reason you know, I started Build, Live, Give was for that very reason that it was, it was so lonely when I left, you know, similar to you, left a successful corporate career doing everything by myself. And uh, yeah, there was, you know, there was lots of groups out there, but no one really that understood my past world and the world that I was currently living in. So that's the whole reason why we started uh, Build, Live, Give. So I think it's yeah, so important to find that community. And uh, as you said, whether it's a mastermind or a community, I think it's uh, brilliant. And also, because um, sometimes your friends and family, like you said, they, they, they want you to be in a better space, but they don't always have the advice or the experience to actually help you get there. Yeah, no, that's great that you do that because I didn't do this because uh, I think a lot of people, you know, sometimes you want, you listen to certain things like looking for tactical advice and things like that, but some of it's just the human being, the human side of this. And uh, I was actually in an event where, you know, there was some marketing stuff going on, but then like there was a guy who came and talked about sleep. <laughs> and I was, I actually remember thinking that was actually a really good session because and when you have your own business, you know, you have the stress and you don't sleep that well and everyone talks about it, but it's kind of an important thing. Just like, you know, people talk much more about what you eat and your exercise, but you know, that human side of it. And so again, to, to the point here is, you know, giving people an opportunity to hear other people's stories and, um, and, and whether it's commiserate or get motivation or whatever that is. Um, you know, I think again, I, I take a lot of, I take a lot from hearing about other people and hearing what they've gone through and, um, and certainly as both, uh, tools as well as inspiration. Yeah, Brian. And if we fast forward now to the build section. So if you walked into a party or a networking event and someone said, you know, uh, Barback, what do you do? How would you describe that? Uh, it depends on what they know and what they don't. Um, I think if folks who are in performance marketing and direct response and that whole world, it's a lot easier for them. I say, I help brands build their performance marketing businesses. And um whether it's customer acquisition, retention, analytics, monetization, kind of essentially a bit of a virtual CMO, um, a chief marketing officer for folks. So for folks who don't know much about it, I may just say I play a bit of a marketing role and help brands grow. <laughs> um, but uh, what it ends up looking like is for the for performance marketing businesses, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very strategic and analytical approach. Uh, I'm generally better at scale. So generally folks who are, 20 million top line uh, in revenue, um, e-com, consumer, generally have some subscription component of their model, which obviously more and more businesses do these days, um, and really help them help them scale and uh, help identify the key levers in the business. And again, generally focused on acquisition and retention. Not surprisingly, I come from an analytics background, so I leverage that, and it's kind of important within a uh, performance marketing business. So um, I'm able to take that, my analytics side, and marry that with, a sense of how to kind of identify actionable insights, and um, and I work with uh, I work with a handful of clients helping them do that. So it's pretty fun. It's pretty awesome, actually. Brilliant. And uh, given all your experience in that field, what are sort of three tips or three common things that you see people not do that you would recommend they should do? Given uh, people listening to this podcast, yeah, I mean, I think one I'd say is um, is simplicity usually trumps complexity. And, uh, and I think in the context, particularly of, um, kind of have this phrase I talk about, which is two offers, two channels and you know, people are like, what does it take to, to, to scale? And in my experience, it takes two offers in two channels. And I think, um, particularly the channel side, when people are running, people always run, want to run ads everywhere. Um, whether mm -hmm. it's Facebook, Google, TV, radio, 
Um, my experience has been companies that have grown uh, and whatever scale means. For some people, it may be six figures. For some, it may be 10. Um, but it's finding something that works and then going deep in there as opposed to when I come across folks that have four or five, let's say, traffic channels that are basically proportionately equal. Um, that means, from my experience, that usually means that someone's not pushing hard enough in one of those areas and exploiting an opportunity. So I find that people oftentimes want to go too broad too quickly um, as opposed to find something that works and really go deep. Um, which, you know, we always talk about kind of um, managing our exposure and risk, but I think the reality is that's just going to be the nature of it. And you have to try to figure that out, but I'd rather go deep and have some of that exposure as opposed to be kind of halfway doing a whole bunch of stuff that ends up not really happening. Um, so I frankly think that's one of the more important things, um, which comes out of simplicity, um, but that that's a big, big deal. Um, and then, you know, I said maybe one of it comes up, which again is core to what I do is, um, or kind of the foundational stuff is, is reporting. Um, I just find a lot of people don't track and report some really basic stuff. And, you know, I think um, it's, you can hire someone who's out of college for pretty cheap, who's good at Excel, um, that can help you kind of understand the business if you don't want to do it yourself. But um, just having some some core metrics, um, some key things in place, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as they say, like that which doesn't get measured doesn't get better. Um, and I've just found that once you start reporting, once you start sending emails to people about reports, things just start getting better because it's front, it's in front of people's faces. Yeah, and it's, it was funny, um, you know, in my corporate days working in Coca-Cola, you know, I, it used to drive me insane because we couldn't do anything without measuring it. And we just had so much data and we were constantly nearly bogged down by it. And then the flip side is I, um, you know, work with a lot of businesses and helping them to scale and they just, you know, the cupboard's bare. They don't have anything. Right. So, uh, and, you know, people often say, what'd you learn from corporate that works really well in small business? I think have that r reporting and then the ability to have the analytics and have an objective versus a subjective view is really, is really beneficial. So uh, I completely uh, agree with that. Um, and, you know, you... By the way, sorry, one quick yeah, thing. Sure. Just, uh, sorry, just... Uh, on that, I think a lot of that kind of maybe gives me my third one. Uh, you'd ask for three, but I think a lot of times people see bigger companies and corporate or just kind of whatever. It's a small business that's bigger than them um, and think they have it better. Um, my experience is everyone thinks the grass is always greener or that everyone has perfect information or perfect systems and things run super, super well when the reality is every business out there has got a bit of a bunch of a mess um, and you got to kind of survive long enough in spite of yourself and in spite of the business's weaknesses. So, you know, I think that's one of the things, um, again, working with a handful of folks now, um, it's even more apparent, which is um, everyone's got their own stuff, um, just like in our personal lives. Uh, you know, whatever you see on Facebook, someone's posting the reality of their life is there's always some messiness, um, kind of like the whole uh, analogy of the duck, wow, uh, you know, flailing around and you don't see what's underwater. I think everyone sees the pretty stuff up top. And I think in, on the business side, I think people assume that just because a company is bigger, they're better in certain respects. And frankly, a lot of, I've seen a lot of big companies and nine figures and 10 figures just weighed down by infrastructure and bureaucracy. And, um, you know, everything has to be standardized or they try to make it standardized. So I think that's one of the things I'd say is, you know, don't assume or don't expect that anything is better at these other places. And, they got their own messes and you just got to kind of manage. We all got to manage through our own stuff. Yeah, I think that's great. And I love that quote. Uh, I think it was that a good to great where, you know, be brutally honest about today, but have a clear vision for the future. Sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I, yeah and I, I totally agree. As far as uh, your learning. So I know, you know, it's been um, a little bit of time now that you've been running your own own, own gig around uh, performance marketing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest learnings for you you know, really the second time round, because I know that first time with the magazine, it wasn't quite that successful. What what have you learned the second time round? I think I'm much more, and it, does, it didn't really apply in the magazine days, but, you know, this whole idea of, like, I'm 44, um, so I, I, I believe in being a learner and a student always, but I think this idea of really play to my strengths and, frankly, like, not really care nearly as much as I used to about my weaknesses. Um, you know, and I think there are people who can shore them up, who can, who I can hire or vendors I can partner with or whatever the case may be. But I think really playing to my strengths, figuring out what they are. Um, I also, I kind of view it as like the last couple of years has been a bunch of testing, um, obviously with real clients and, you know, real dollars, but you know, there are a bunch of things now that I don't do that I, uh, might've taken on or did take on a couple of years ago 
um, when I first started, but some of it's being, you know, it's a combination of self-awareness. It's recognizing what the market says um, and says yes and no to, and then really just, just playing to my strengths. And again, I'm aware of my weaknesses. So like, as an example, like I don't write copy. Anyone wants to write copy, like you do not come to me because that's not what I do. Um, but I'm great at, you know, the very strategic analytical approach towards um, working with, with my clients. And so, you know, I know where my lane is. My lane is mm -hmm. wide enough that I could, that there's enough there. And at the same time, though, I don't really spend nearly that much time. I don't, I don't try to portray that I can do something that I can't. I mean, I think especially in like as a consultant where they're hiring me, I'm in a brand management business. And so making sure that my brand is intact and that I'm, you know, I put all my clients on my website, 100% of anyone I work with, they've all been good about like not worrying about confidentiality, but I put them all up there. And so, um, you know, I think really understanding my strengths, playing to those and and then again, trying to go hard to my point of with what I think works for other folks is is go hard with what um, what I've seen work well. Um, and then I've also just again because my I don't need so many clients, um, so I've I got tested things like direct mail, which everyone's like, really direct mail? I'm like, yeah, because who is actually sending a FedEx to a thirty million dollar you know CMO or CEO? It's not that many people, so it stand out. Um, in my case, just for a couple other reasons, it actually has stopped and I'm writing more content because i think that works a little bit better and i can control it better but in general it's i think i've figured out a little bit more about what more my strengths are and then the way to get in front of people um and then now it's figure out you know i got to get some leverage in my model and in my business so that's kind of the next that's the next thing i'm tackling yeah and and i think it's a, a brilliant point in technology like us now you're in la I'm in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and, uh, you know, we're having a, a brilliant conversation. I think now you can be, a, and, you know, your very best leverage your strength, be an expert, but play anywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I so I just hired a woman uh, a few months ago as a marketing assistant. Um, actually, I wrote a, I did a kind of recorded a video about it, but I got 500 plus people, candidates to apply for that role. Now, granted, I did not talk to all of them and many of them were not the right fit for one reason or another. But the fact that I could get that many candidates, manage the whole thing myself, not go completely crazy and get someone who was pretty darn solid. Um, you know, for me, that's just one example. Um, and the fact that, you know, she literally actually lives in a van <laughs> with her boyfriend. And, you know, as long as she has a hotspot, she's accessible and I've done Skype videos. So it's not like she's in the far reaches of the world. Um, I mean, that just those kinds of things, like it is remarkable. It's, it is a thousand times easier to really get going today than it was even a year ago. Um, you know, how technology has made things just that much simpler. Uh, it, it is pretty amazing. Yeah. And look, you know, I'm sure you had times and I certainly did when I was in corporate where I, I really didn't want to go to work because I was doing things that, you know, I had to do that I didn't love to do mm -hmm. versus now actually waking up every day and doing the things you'd love to do just the uh, you know the the motivation and the um the power that uh gives you is a, is enormous so uh completely agree with you and i think the better you niche and be the best at something and just stick to that lane way and get others in which is uh, your advice i think is uh is perfect and uh, well and i'd say it's not like 100% of what i do i love every single day by any stretch but there's a big difference when it's my choice. <laughs> so I always, I'm always, and sometimes I say to my out loud, but it's more to myself is, look, you know, this is kind of, someone asked me how my day is going. I'm like, look, trust me, I'm, I don't mean to be complaining. If you ask me like, it may be some of the challenges that are going on, but there's a huge difference. It, this is my choice, right? So when I traveled a bunch for the last couple of weeks, that's my choice. You know, when I got, you know, I feel like I got a lot of work and I'm up late some nights, like that's my choice. So, but it's a fundamentally different mindset and perspective when it's my choice versus someone else's so yeah. that that for me is where a lot of the you know a lot of the excitement and passion comes from but you know i wish every single moment of every day i was passionate about everything i was doing like that's just not the reality of it right it's just it's not practical uh, at least not right now yet <laughs> yeah and you talked about you know scaling your business is one of your key challenges just on the challenges what are some other things that you face at the moment you know, I mean, my model, because I'm a consultant, is I, um, is I'm essentially work for hire. You know, I have a retainer model. Um, I know some folks who do some other things. So, you know, I love what I do. I love the diversity. I'm actually not ADD. I just, I like working with a handful of folks. But leverage is something I want, right? And so, you know, you know, financial, you know, security and all that kind of stuff is important to me. 
So as I build, as I, and I don't want to build an agency, I may do some, I may hire a couple of folks kind of to help on the consulting side. I'm thinking about some, uh, an analytics platform. My wife is a product developer. So there's some irons in the fire and, and things I'm thinking about, but definitely, you know, the fact that um, people hire me right now. And then I, I partner with some folks here and there, certainly, but um, that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a neat thing because they're hiring me and it's also, it's a tough thing from the side of like, it's me right now. And so, um, and again, some probably for personal reasons, I've decided not to scale this consulting business um, in a way maybe that I could have. And I certainly probably could have gone down an agency route. I just didn't want to do it um, more than just, I just, other than just feel and, and, and desire. So, um, but getting leverage, I think that's ultimately in, in figuring out kind of in testing again, being very, I'm, I'm big on, testing with the real stuff i used to test in a conversation and that doesn't really that's not a test so i think that's a big shift that i've made frankly and uh, a commercial wage I, I ask this question to everyone as to you know when did you not maybe get the money that you got at uh, beach body but where you were comfortable with you and sarah that you'd mm -hmm. achieved a commercial wage in the business um have you achieved that and and if not when do you think you'll achieve that um i mean i'm happy with my numbers right now that's what you mean and so you know i think there's also just i had a friend who said to me you know because i said look you know i have i have x amount saved and i know what my runway is and you know his comment was and this was post the startup kind of with three, within three four months we had a conversation and he said look but the reality is you don't want to tap into your savings um you, you just you really don't want to do that if you don't i mean it's kind of obvious to say you don't want to tap into there if you don't need to but it was just this reminder a little bit of like i could have been a little bit lazy and said well you know i got these savings I don't have to push as aggressively. And the reality was I did need to. And I think that was actually a crutch that I shouldn't have uh, thought was okay to tap into. Because the moment you start tapping into that and backing off and not, and for at least for me, that I stopped being that aggressive and pushing and proactive, um, you know, it's a, I don't want to get in that dangerous place. So, you know, I think it was probably, you know, and for me, it's a little bit of like, are we break even on our day to day? Um, you know, that's, that's the, the very basic level. And there's obviously then, build assets and build wealth and, you know, savings and things like that. But I'd say within probably six months. Yeah. Let's say within October of 15, I felt actually pretty good. And then, you know, some things with consulting, it's, you know, it's, it's not feast or famine and uh, hopefully not anymore, but there have definitely been some cycles. So, you know, and, um, and I took a little bit of time being not as aggressive about it, but that's again, the nature of this business, you got to have the pipeline going. And so I know that I always have to have, um, content out there and, and talking to folks because um, I'm frankly just paranoid about um, about having a dry pipeline and um, you know just that's just the nature of it so um, I'd say it took a bit but then you know I'm constantly in that mindset of being paranoid um, we're going for that and uh, Sarah we've mentioned Sarah a couple of times but uh, when Sarah listens to this podcast what would you like to say to her about the help and support she's given you during this journey well, I can turn to her right now if you want me to and tell her as I'm saying it to you. Um, she's right here working. No, I mean, look, she knows it, um, but I think the support that she has given um, has been crucial. So, um, and she's smiling back at me right now. Um, no, the support, I mean, like that's, that, I think you can't underestimate that and, and how important it is and to, to know that, again, when the startup died or like when things are, when I'm frustrated and I just kind of frankly have to talk about stuff that she probably isn't as keen on talking about some of the details and, and the minutia, but it's important to me. It's a bit of my process um, about unwinding and things like that. And sometimes it's like, she's the closest person. So she gets to hear it or has to hear it in that case. Um, you know, but I, I think the support is crucial. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun and obviously for her and for the kids and our family and things like that, it's a big reason of why I do what I do. And frankly, it's the reason why she wants to get her stuff uh, going as well. And so, um, I think keeping that in mind, and that's the reminder for me of working from home is even when I'm on a call or I'm busy and my son comes in and says, can we do something? You know, sometimes I can't do it right away, but there's this reminder of like, this is the reason you're doing it. So you can spend your time later at night when he's asleep or when they're asleep and things like that. But it's a constant reminder of like, I'm doing this because I want the freedom and the flexibility and that kind of stuff to spend the time the way I want to, not just because I want to be doing calls all day long or and I like them, but it's like, that's the constant reminder. So both from Sarah and from the kids, uh, that's a huge part of, I mean, that, that's my why, right? And so 
um, that's a big, big part of, you know, my day to day and, and being aware of that. Great. And the next section is the live section. Just for the BLG listeners, just give them a quick insight into the daily habits that help make you successful. Uh, well, I got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. So, you know, everyone talks about morning habits. Um, I, uh, mine is not as consistent probably as I would prefer it, but, uh, which means I just get up earlier. Um, and, uh, and for me, that's like five thirty, six o'clock, let's say, um, it's important for me to get a workout in. Um, if I get a workout like four or five days a week, I'm good about 30, 40 minutes, you know, so that's my thing. Um, it's kind of generally my time. My, my boys will come in and I've, again, I'm a back office gym, so it's actually fun for them to see it, but it's also sometimes I'd just like to be done and then I can actually spend time with them. Um, but yeah, my morning, you know, it's, it's, um, that is the exercise and, you know, I, I try to eat healthy. Um, I, I generally do it. I think, you know, when you have your own business, the realization that what you put in your body has a direct impact on your productivity and financial, um, situation is a big deal, right? Cause I feel better. I have more energy. Um, and that has a direct, uh, it's not just correlation. It's absolutely related to my ability to deliver my work, talk to clients, talk to new clients, things like that. And so um, that's a big, big deal. And then, um, you know, we get time with 20 our TV. I've basically pretty much almost canceled direct TV now. Um, TV never, almost never goes on in this house. Um, and then I think there's frankly a bit of, whether it's the beginning of the day, end of the day, just setting a sense of plan and intention for um, things. Because you can get so easily caught up in email or phone calls. And so um, I'm, a, I'm very strict with my calendar. So if it's on my calendar, then it happens. And if it's not on my calendar, it generally doesn't. So even if it's not a call, but it's something I got to get done, I'll put it on my calendar just because that's, that's my process. And that helps me. Um, that's just, again, that's the nature of it. Again, not perfect, but um, I've got some side to-do list, but my calendar is a big part of um, things to the point where I've literally put something on my calendar at 930 saying prep for bed. And not that I'm in bed at 10 o'clock, but it's a much bigger reminder um, and that, again, that works for me to have a calendar thing to say, go to bed as opposed to just knowing it as, as silly in many ways as that probably sounds. And the next section is the give section. Uh, what's a cause that, uh, you support and you care about? Yeah. I mean, there's been a, there's a nonprofit that I've been a part of for 10 plus years now. It's called Leadership. Um, we, uh, it was a leadership program for college kids, a six day program where, um, generally it's either kids on the same campus or, um, from a handful of campuses come um, and really we spend, I, I've both sponsored students as well as helped to co-lead for about, I don't know, it's 30, 40,000 students now have gone through the program in the last 30 years, um, maybe like 60 or 80 sessions a year now. And, uh, you know, we talk about what do they want to do with their lives? What kind of impact do they want to have? And, um, and they come up with a vision for themselves and the future world they want and, you know, then kind of talk about stretch goals and manageable goals and frankly, things that a lot of people who are adults that never got the chance to do. And so it's a really cool opportunity, but it's also really, really inspiring. I think I talked really about, you know, being a role model for my kids. You know, when you're co-leading one of those sessions, I, I kind of have to be my best self. Um, and I try to be pretty darn good day to day, but definitely there, I got to be my best self. And then it's also really inspiring and motivating to see the kinds of things that people want to go do and, and what they really care about and their passion. So it's a way to kind of to give and frankly to help hopefully tee up some folks who are going to do some pretty great things uh, in their futures and give them some tools um, and support to, to get there. And the last section is the action section and just some quick fire responses to uh, these questions would be great. So what's your number one personal productivity tip? Probably what I said earlier, which is have a plan um, as simple as it may be, but going into the day and the week with a plan as opposed to just kind of winging it. Right. And on your phone or desktop, what are some of the apps that uh, you love to use to help you be productive? Uh, Evernote is key for me. Um, Dropbox. Uh, I love podcasts and uh, Audible. So I do a lot of listening to books um, on tape or on whatever on video uh, recorded. I mean, digital. So, um, yeah, I think those, and then I got my socials, my social ones, which frankly are work, more work related, but I got to have a little bit of that. <laughs> right. And if, you know, you mentioned podcasts, what's a, a, a favorite podcast that you love to listen to and why? So other than this one, you know, I got to, I got to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm big on stories right now. And so the moth is a big one for me. It's, you know, it's one of the top ones. 
Um, there's another one called uh, Risk and another one called Snap Judgment, those three. But I think in anything we do, whether in some form of communication, it's about stories. And I think a lot of marketers talk about that, but I think in our day-to-day -day lives, and it's not about manipulation, right? Because that's not the point. Um, it's certainly not in my personal life, and I only want it in the professional life. But um, I love listening to stories, and then I've been reading some stuff about stories, and um, that's, that's a little bit of where I'm putting a little bit of attention right now. Um, I think it's good just to know and be better at, and then, you know, whether it applies personally, professionally, whatever, um, so much the better. And then it's when you can be entertained and learn at the same time, that's, that's always a nice plus. Brilliant. And look, uh, you know, you've had such a wonderful journey that you've shared with the BLG audience today from, you know, your MIT through to uh, Beachbody, uh, a fail magazine venture and uh and now really starting to scale your own marketing agency or your marketing consulting business i should say not agency you know what's some uh advice that you'd like to give as some parting advice to the blg listeners you know it's funny someone a couple of days ago posted on facebook and asked something kind of similar and um and I, my response was simply done is better than perfect um and i think a lot of us try to convince ourselves that we're perfectionists um, or the things that we're, we're embarrassed or do want it to be just right. And the reality is that perfection, first of all, doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, as Seth Godin says, just publish. And, you know, if you're at the point where some, when you put something out that you're super proud of it and all that, you've waited way too long. Um, and so, you know, I think you get in, when you get in this habit of putting stuff out there, you know, whether it's a video or a site or a product or whatever it is, and it's got to have reasonable you know, it's got to be reasonably uh, reasonable quality, but I think oftentimes we wait too long or wait until the situation is just right, as opposed to get it out and then iterate um, and, and then just work it and get in that habit of it. And so it's not overthinking about it, but it's just, you know, again, done is better than perfect. And it's certainly not my line, but, um, and trust me, I, I still, I got my own challenges on it, but it's, um, I try to, I try to remind myself of that. And uh, I think that's one of the better things, especially when you're getting, frankly, when you're getting going or even regardless of whatever state you're at, um, you know, I think at some point you, you, there, perfection doesn't exist. So you got to get going and, uh, and, and focus on the key stuff. And how can people find out more about you? Um, my personal site is in uh, my blog. It's where I have my content and all that. That's probably the easiest place. That's uh, my name, uh, bobakazad.com. And then I'm pretty much, um, and I imagine you have links uh, on that's B-A-B-A-K-A-Z-A-D.com. And then I'm pretty much on every platform um, under Bob Akazad. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, pretty much everything. So other than Gmail, someone else, uh, someone else has that Gmail address, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, my blog and, uh, and any social thing, I'm, I'm pretty much accessible, uh, most places. Brilliant. Well, we'll put definitely that, those links and other links that you've mentioned in, in the show notes so people can, uh, find you. And as you said, you know, sort of those 20 million plus e-commerce or subscription-based businesses i think uh, your experience in direct response and performance marketing would be uh, fantastic but i really wanted to thank you for sharing your journey uh, today i know we caught up about 18 months ago and it's really great to see how far you've progressed i think you've got an awesome way of looking at how to grow a business but also um, most importantly about how you live a great life and I love how you're combining both of those. And I wish you, Sarah, and, and the two boys all the best. And I really enjoyed having you on the, the show today. I appreciate that. Very kind words. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Corporate Escapees podcast, brought to you by the team at Build, Live, Give. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with other corporate escapees. If you would like to join a community of like-minded peers, please visit www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening and be